in the near future, you're probably going to read a lot about so-called historical analogs of gun control laws that supposedly existed, going all the way back to our nation's founding and beyond, that somehow under the NYSERPA versus Bruin standard can be used and do justify upholding modern day gun control laws. I want to talk a little bit about how, how to understand these historical analogs and to help you put them into certain buckets so you can rebut them because I can assure you there are very few historical analogs when properly analyzed in the context of American history that can justify really any modern gun control laws outside of those laws that ban, for example, let's say the misuse of firearms. Stay tuned. We're going to talk all about this when we get back. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gunner, and constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and New York Times bestselling author. If you have not subscribed to the Four Boxes Diner Second Amendment channel, please do so. Show your love for the right to keep and bear arms, and also help us hit 100,000 subscribers. We're working really hard to get to that number to help us with the social media algorithms. So the way to understand historical analogs is to put it in the context of what the U.S. Supreme Court taught us in NYSERPA versus Bruin. But I want to step back for just one second and remind you, the way to conceptually, now I know you're going to harass me about some of this stuff about where our rights come from, which we know that the right to keep and bear arms is indeed a pre-existing right. That's not my opinion, although it is my opinion. It's really the articulation of the United States Supreme Court in Hiller that specifically said that the Second Amendment codified pre-existing rights. Okay, with that out of the way, I want to help you understand the Bruin methodology in a very simple way. And I'm going to do a little digression. The way to think about the nice Serpa versus Bruin methodology is this. You start out with the text of the Second Amendment, the operative language. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That text is not to be interpreted in a vacuum. What I mean by that is you take that language as it was understood at the time of our founding in 1791. If you're an inferior court or a lower court or anyone else interpreting the Second Amendment, you start with the text of the Second Amendment. But again, you take the text. If you want to know what the people mean, if you want to know what the word bear means, if you want to know what the word keep means, if you want to know what the word arms means, you start with the text. But what that means is you interpret the text as defined by the Supreme Court precedents in Heller, McDonald, Caetano, and of course Bruin, because they define all the major terms in those cases. So you don't have to go out and try to search for a dictionary, try to understand what these words mean. You actually generally know what they mean from the U.S. Supreme Court precedents of those cases. So you just have to read the text of the Second Amendment and the U.S. Supreme Court cases, and that's going to give you the definition of most of the critical terms, if not all of them. Now, so the way to understand it, the way I explain it is the text giveth our rights. The text giveth our rights. That's step one. Step two is that the government bears the burden. The government has the burden and bears the burden to demonstrate that notwithstanding the text of the Second Amendment as defined by the U.S. Supreme Court's precedents, there is an opportunity for the government to show that certain laws that exist today on the books can still be constitutional and not violate the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms. Well, how does the government do that? Well, once the text covers an activity, that activity or that object, in the case of arms, is presumptively protected. Presumptively protected by the Second Amendment, presumptively a fundamental right that we have. So what does the government get to do? The government, the government has an opportunity to proffer or set forth historical analog laws, meaning laws that restricted firearms, firearm use in some way at the founding period or in our, or of our history. And somehow these laws were not just one-offs, these were part of a long-standing tradition of regulating firearms or their use. For example, we know you can't use firearms to commit murder or to otherwise misuse firearms to commit crimes. That has been outlawed literally from the beginning of time since we've had firearms. You cannot use them to commit crimes. So that is a, that is a no-brainer that it, you know any, anything that prevents the misuse of firearms to commit a crime, to harass, to assault, to engage in battery that's unlawful, that obviously is not protected by the Second Amendment. That's a no-brainer, but that illustrates the point that as long as there's a long-standing history restricting or prohibiting some activity when it comes to firearms, that allows, that can stand. That does not violate the Second Amendment. Those modern-day gun control laws, or those modern laws, if you will, human laws, not gun control laws, those modern restrictions on human activity with firearms, uh, they can stand as being constitutional, notwithstanding the fact the Second Amendment exists. So 
what I want to talk about is the types of historical analogs. And when you hear the words historical analogs, what they're talking about are laws that existed at some prior period in time than modern America, and that uh, they somehow justify modern day gun control laws. So that's what historical analogs really are. It's referring to old laws, okay? Old laws or old regulations involving firearms. Now, I have took a quick look at a series of submissions by the parties in several California cases involving alleged, you know, you know, alleged violations of the Second Amendment. And I want to just talk about five or six different types of categories I see the anti-gunners are trying to use in terms of historical analogs. And I want to talk about just quickly how to analyze those historical analogs and why many of them are just not applicable. And I'm going to do it very generally in this video, and then we can break it down into future videos as needed. To begin with, remember, there's two parts to a historical analog at a minimum for it to be relevant. The first is the time period. Did these laws exist at a relevant time period? For example, if some law existed 500 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, well, that might not really teach us anything about what modern American law speaks to when it comes to, let's say, American, the American Revolution. So the relevant time period, as I see it, is the founding era, which is really somewhere around 1760 to maybe 1826. I always stop the founding era to say there's no way the founding era can go past 1826. And that's because in 1826, on July 4th, 1826, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, that's right, Jefferson and Adams, both died literally on July 4th, 1826, which was the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Certainly, it seems to me divine intervention played a role there. Um, I leave that up to you as to what you think about it. But we know that as of 1826, the founding fathers that were responsible for the American Revolution and writing the Constitution uh, at that point had basically passed away. So whatever anybody thought about gun laws and the Second Amendment the Constitution thereafter, uh, they're not speaking for the founding generation because the founding generation was no more. They had disappeared. So 1826 is really the last conceivable period where you can look to gun control laws to argue that there's somehow uh, a historical analog that can justify a modern-day gun control law because after that, you'd be outside the founding period and it wouldn't speak to what the founding generation understood the Second Amendment to cover or not to cover. Okay, so once we've talked about the, uh, that time period, I want to remind you that the reason why you see the anti-gunners, as I, pred I predicted on this channel, and now it's become quite true, uh, the good news is I think some of my articles, including a very major article I wrote in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy just a few months ago, arguing that 1791, that time period of 1791, the founding period, is the key time period for understanding historical analogs. Uh, anything after the Civil War is too late and doesn't count under Supreme Court precedent and common sense and beyond. Uh, I think that my view is, which is not just my view, I think it's the U.S. Supreme Court's view, by the way, which I think is consistent with my view. Uh, I think it's slowly but surely winning the day. The right time period is the late 1700s in that window of time around 1791 when the Second Amendment was actually written because that's when you'd want to understand the text because that's when it was written. All the 14th Amendment did in 1868, as you recall, the 14th Amendment came about after the Civil War. The 14th Amendment was really just about making sure that the freed African-American slaves were given full rights to citizenship like all the other Americans at the time, including the right to keep and bear arms. So the 14th Amendment really just said that the, seven, that the Second Amendment, as understood in 1791, was applied to all Americans, including the freed slaves. That's what the 14th Amendment really did. It just took the Second Amendment and applied it to everyone. It did not change the meaning of the Second Amendment in any respect. And if you look at case after case after case by the U.S. Supreme Court, they always interpret the original Bill of Rights by looking to 18th century history in the 1700s, because that's when the document was written. And you can't, again, when you get to the late uh, 19th century, as we know, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and the founding generation are all long dead. So, you know, anything that occurs in the late 19th century doesn't speak to what the founding generation understood the Second Amendment or the Bill of Rights to mean. So that's why you never look there. You always look to the late 1700s to interpret the Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment. Now, with that said, so with that time period said, let us move on. And again, a one reminder before I get to these specific analogs, if you're dealing with an arms possession ban case... I repeat, if you're dealing with an arms possession ban case, meaning you can't possess an AR-15 style firearm, you can't possess a semi-automatic AK-47, you cannot possess a magazine that holds more than 10 rounds, any of these cases, 
dealing with arms bans, where people are being banned from possessing certain arms, whether it be firearms, uh, magazines, ammunition, triggers, it doesn't matter, anything touching on arms, you do not have to, I repeat, you do not have to deal with historical analogs. I repeat, you do not have to deal with historical analogs. You only have to apply the Supreme Court's test for dealing with arms ban cases as articulated by Heller uh, and McDonald and then Catano, which is just ask yourself, are these arms commonly used by Americans today for lawful purposes? If the answer is yes, they are protected. It doesn't matter. The government is over. And the reason why when it comes to arms ban cases is because in Heller and Caetano and McDonald, the Supreme Court has already looked at the historical analogs to, they've already looked at the history of the Second Amendment's text and the historical analogs to see are there gun ban rules or regulations or laws that could justify a modern day ban on arms. And they've already done the analysis and they concluded in Heller that if an arm is commonly used by Americans for lawful purposes, it's a protected arm. They already figured out the legal standard. No additional work needs to be done on this other than to figure out whether or not what is being banned is commonly uh, is commonly used by Americans for lawful purposes. And if we're dealing with semi-automatic rifles like AR-15s or magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, those are clearly arms and they're clearly commonly used by Americans. They're clearly protected by the Second Amendment. But beyond that, once we get out of the arms ban cases, we're no longer dealing with arms ban possession cases. And we're talking about other Second Amendment type issues, sensitive places, meaning government mandated gun free zones. You can't bring your gun to a public library or whatever. Um, you you know, you're not allowed to, uh, you know, uh, carry your gun without getting a particular permit and then getting a license. And that license requires references. All these other issues that we're talking about in the space of the Second Amendment does require courts to look to historical analogs to see if there's an analog that's analogous to the modern day gun control law that is being challenged. And rather than get in the specifics, I just want to give you the categories of buckets that I'm seeing the anti-gunners using, which I don't think will ultimately be persuasive. And I just want to flag those buckets right now. So the first bucket that I'm noticing, outside of the fact that a lot of these laws they're setting forth are outside the relevant time period, they're either way too early. I've seen some laws are talking about from the 1300s, uh, way too early, or these laws from the 1300s, England, um, which really don't count. Now, there's an exception to this. If a law from the 1300s or a law from England was adopted by the United States into the Americas at the time of our founding, so if, in the, hypothetically, if you had a law from 1350, England, that was subsequently adopted by the states in, let's say, 1791, well, that would be relevant, but it wouldn't be relevant because it's English or it wouldn't be relevant because it was from 1350. It'd be relevant because it was adopted into America at the time of our founding and existed at the time of the founding. Uh, that's why it would be relevant. But if it's just in England or years ago, wrong time period and wrong country doesn't count. Now, let's go beyond that. Um, let us also talk about a prominent example of this kind of law that was discussed in Bruin is the statute of Northampton, which I think did come from the 1300s, England, and some states adopted a form of the statute of Northampton, but here the United States Supreme Court basically distinguished it and said it wasn't persuasive for uh, overriding the right of the people to keep and bear arms, and that was not a basis for denying people the right to carry guns for a whole host of reasons that you can read about in Bruin if you care to do so. But a statute of Northampton is an example of something that was exi in existence for hundreds of years in England before coming to the United States, at least in certain states that adopted it as an analog. The next kind of thing we see is a lot of these so-called slave codes. Just as a reminder, at the time of our founding, there were laws that banned slaves from possessing firearms because they were not considered Americans. They were not considered citizens. Likewise, there were certain restrictions on Indians. You couldn't sell guns to certain Indians, Indian tribes. There were certain restrictions on what Indians could and could not do because, again, they weren't considered American citizens. Uh, when it came to American citizens, they had certain rights. But again, as Clarence Thomas discussed in Nicerba versus Bruin, he points out that Roger Taney's decision in Dred Scott uh, an infamous case in the Dred Scott case, he says that obviously, you know, the African Americans uh, could not be deemed American citizens because if they could be deemed American citizens in the context of the Dred Scott case, 
they would have various rights, including the right to keep and bear arms. And that was something Clarence Thomas observed that really the purpose, for example, of the 14th Amendment was to make sure that the Second Amendment would be, uh, you know, that, that people, including the freed slaves, could benefit from the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms. And the 14th Amendment basically allowed that to take place. So again, any of these laws, remember there were slave codes at the time of our founding that prevented slaves from being able to carry guns or have guns without the permission of the owners. Obviously, I don't think those are analogous because again, the slaves at the time, uh, the blacks in the South at the time, and also the Indians and Tories were not considered American citizens uh, and therefore they could be denied their rights because again, they weren't viewed as part of the polity. So I don't know how that's analogous to uh, saying that an American citizen somehow loses their gun rights just because we don't want them to have it. I don't think that's a sufficient analogy and I don't think that historical analog will work. The next one is so-called surety laws. Now, surety laws are a little complicated, but they're very good for us. The anti-gunners try to argue that surety laws are bad for us, but they're actually very good for us. Now, what is a surety law? It's really a law that forces people to post bonds. You see, back in like around 1826, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts adopted a surety law and it worked like this. If you thought your neighbor was a danger to you, with a firearm, you could go to court, file a complaint, and argue that the neighbor should post a bond because he was particularly dangerous toward you with firearms. And the judge had the authority, if he found after a trial that your neighbor was dangerous, he did not have the authority to take away guns or to prevent you prevent the neighbor from carrying guns, but he could force the neighbor to post a bond or a surety. So the anti-gunners like to use these sureties to say, see, we can put conditions on the right to carry, but they actually, the surety laws backfire on the anti-gunners because the surety laws presuppose that there is a trial and a finding of fact that the gun owner is a danger to himself or to someone else before they post, before they require him to post a bond. And mind you, here's the key, even after a trial and even after that gun owner is found to be a danger, he or she does not lose their gun rights under, you know, 1826 Massachusetts surety laws. They only have to post a bond. And then if they misuse the firearm, they lose the bond. But again, it's not even a gun ban or it's, it's basically just the posting of a bond. And again, only after a trial that you personally have been deemed to be a danger to yourself or to someone else. So the surety laws actually don't help the anti-gunners. Actually may be a basis for knocking out red flag laws going forward down the road, but we'll see how that plays out. The next set of historical analogs, I, I noticed that California and some of these anti-gun groups are talking about to justify modern day gun control laws are gunpowder laws. Now here's the key. If there are restrictions on the use of guns or gunpowder or something at the time of the founding, the U.S. Supreme Court says you need to look carefully as to why. I repeat, you need to look carefully as to why those laws or regulations on guns or, or gunpowder were enacted. You see, there were restrictions on the storage. Here's an example of this. This is the best example, I think. There are restrictions at the time of our founding in places like Boston on the storage of black powder, gunpowder. The reason why there were certain restrictions on how much you could store was not because the people that enacted that legislation at the time of our founding were worried about guns. No, those regulations that restricted the, restricted the storage of gunpowder, they were motivated by worries about fire. They were concerned that because the city of Boston and other cities at the time, at the time of our founding, were largely constructed out of wood, if you stored large quantities of gunpowder or other flammable materials and they caught fire, you literally could burn down the entire city and this has happened. Remember, London actually burned down into because of a fire. So there was a legitimate concern that gunpowder could start a fire that burned down entire cities. Again, the Supreme Court says that those laws are not good historical analogs to justify modern gun control laws because the motive behind them was not gun control. It was fire safety considerations, and those are therefore not appropriate historical analogs to use to justify the, uh, and uphold modern day gun control laws. Another example of this would be seasonal hunting rules. So to the extent there was restrictions on hunting, those again were motivated not because people didn't want you carrying a gun, they didn't want you hunting 
on their land, perhaps, or they did not want you hunting uh, animals in the wrong season for you know environmental conservation considerations. Again, again, the hunting re restrictions had nothing to do with concerns about gun control or your or us trusting you with guns. It had everything to do with other considerations, whether it be uh, conservation efforts or uh, animal protection, uh, things of this nature. Again. They're not appropriate historical analogs to justify modern-day gun control laws, which are motivated by stopping crime, uh, when those historical analogs were simply motivated, again, about conservation or environmental considerations, totally unrelated to safety considerations associated with crime and guns. And last but not least, you see one of the other kind of categories of the gun control laws that the anti-gunners are using to justify modern-day gun control laws. They're trying to point to historical analogs of you can't misuse the firearm, but again, uh, that's not really analogous to anything because we agree you cannot misuse a firearm now to commit murder. You can't misuse a firearm now to commit robbery. You cannot misuse a firearm to do all sorts of crimes. Um, so, and again, we know you cannot misuse a firearm to go and terrorize the people. So those are longstanding laws. Uh, no one disagrees that you can't, that the Second Amendment doesn't allow you to misuse firearms. Uh, that is a longstanding tradition that even though you have the right to keep and bear arms, that only gives you the right to have guns and to carry guns peaceably uh, for the purposes of anticipating confrontation or, or self-defense efforts. Uh, that doesn't allow you to go on a rampage or go on the offense. That is obviously not protected by the Second Amendment because the historical uh, laws, the longstanding historical tradition in the United States of that kind of law uh, bars such misuse of firearms. I hope you learned a little bit something here today at the Four Boxes Diner. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. And we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.